given the madness we're surrounded by perpetually, I thought it might be fun <laughs> to grab a glass of wine, that being the fun bit, and just go through three of the stories from today um, with a slightly sarcastic tone. I think it might be just what we all require. So if you're watching now, this isn't the Katie's Arms, my pub online that I run on the Friday. It's just a kind of a Thursday commentary on Batshit Bonkers Britain. So we have Michael Gove running around with a new definition for extremism. Just before we get into that, you know, this is Michael Gove and it's it's typical of what we face with the establishment and their ability to completely kind of clean slate and move on. You know, never mind how much white powder may or may not have gone up Michael Gove's nose or him, you know, dancing alone in clubs to Technotronic or leaving his wife because obviously he's been kind of cosplaying as a straight guy for all of his life. You just park all of that and onwards we march. It's something um, about the forgiveness that happens to politicians of a certain kind if they're accepted and one of the establishment, anything that happens to them, it just kind of falls off of them. Um, falls from their side where it will stick to the rest of us like glue. Regardless, he's now coming up with a new definition of extremism. And one of the uh, media strategies, if you're under fire or in trouble, is to come out with something, to give yourself something else to talk about so that when you're attacked on all sides, you just start ploughing forwards with the new policy idea. So it's why if you watch in the thick of it, you see them say, what we need is a policy. Come on, quick, what a policy, a policy. Uh, I know, free meals for children, a uh, policy. Uh, maybe the policy is, it's basically coming up with a policy in order to distract from whatever is causing issues for you. And that's precisely the case with Michael Gove. Michael Gove is being investigated for lobbying um, for the VIP lane for PPE contracts. So one of the firms that had the most amount of money thrown at it through the VIP lane um, for PPE uh, was a firm that lobbied Michael Gove personally. And there is an investigation into that. And that has been breaking through recently in a number of media outlets and he's being questioned about it. So what better time for Michael Gove than to thrust himself forward, be given a lovely policy to talk about that will capture headlines and take away headlines from the fact that he is under investigation in the same way that, well, I mean, Michel Moe should be behind bars. So that's what you're seeing here is a media communication strategy to protect one of their own. Hence, you've got this extremist policy. And then at a sort of more surface level, you know exactly how this crap works. So he stands there, he talks about extremism and intolerance. He talks about three Muslim organisations that are going to be on the list for a closer looked cage and I don't know, the Association of Muslim, Muslims or whatever. And in order to offset that or balance that or keep the Muslim council happy or keep possible Labour voters happy or keep the Muslim massive happy, he then mentions a couple of kind of patriotic or nationalist organisations as well. And therein lies exactly the problem with this pathetic policy that's utterly meaningless is as soon as you hear them say, oh, we're looking at this, this and this. Oh, but we're also looking at, you know, patriotic alternative. You just have to throw a few far right things under the bus as well so that, you know, things look balanced. Like you're some sort of father dividing smarties between kids that are fighting. And it's all so pathetic. There's so many layers to this. But ultimately, uh, I think for me, the thing that won't be talked about is just the endless redemption, not just of the male, but the redemption of figures who are beloved by the establishment because they will always come to heal and do what they're told. And Michael Gove is one of them. The other story I wanted to talk about, uh, there's three really, is Jeremy Vine taking Joey Barton to court or certainly beginning defamation proceedings against Joey Barton. 
So Joey Barton, and forgive me if I misquote on this or I'm factually incorrect, but at some point put out a tweet where he used the hashtag bike nonce in association with Jeremy Vine. So something, you know, and I think he made reference to if you see this guy outside a primary school called 999, all done with a sort of a wink and a nod, all done in a kind of banter, football banter way, uh, all done with a kind of, uh, you know, I think you're a bit of an ass, and so I'm saying this about you, which sits squarely in my my stuff. You know, this used to be what would be called funny, or in America certainly would be called free speech or Joey Button having an opinion. Anyway, because of defamation laws being ridiculous in the UK, because of me, this defamation action against Joey Barton has legs. So the law, as you will appreciate, was written in a time before the car, it was written in the time of the horse and cart. And yet that same law is now being used in the modern day to deal with things like social media and Twitter and other things. Mm. So you have judges with no understanding of Twitter or social media trying to apply law that was written in the time before the horse and cart to nuanced stuff or comedy on Twitter or banter on Twitter or free speech. And when I lost everything in the High Court, it wasn't because I wanted to be there. It was because I was certain that I had to stand up for something because it could not be possible that you could say serious harm was done to someone with words alone online that had been deleted, retracted and apologised for if there was no proof. But because I was the monster and needed to be eviscerated and was and lost everything and Mark lost everything and the home and everything, as a result, there is case law that says perceived serious harm is done at the moment of publication. That's the new law that was made especially for me and that will be being used by Jeremy Vine's legal team now to sue Joey Barton. And it was why I I stood to fight and, and knew potentially what I might lose because I knew that couldn't be correct. I know perceived serious harm cannot be correct and yet it is law in this country right now because of my case law. So Jeremy Vine will use that law to bring a defamation case against Joey Barton and he served papers today, I believe. And the lad that served papers to Joey Barton evidently was lovely and was like, we totally back you, Joey, and we're completely behind you. And we think it's all great. The only thing I'd say about that is it's all very well to have lots of lovely support, but it doesn't pay the bills when you lose your house. And the horrible thing is for Joey to make this go away, he has to pay. He have to pay Jeremy Vine 40 grand and he'll have to pay the costs of the solicitors and the solicitors costs are horrific because the solicitors don't just charge like a few hours work they pile on expert opinion this and that you know it's thousands of pounds worth of costs so this whole thing will be horribly expensive for Joey Barton to get rid of and I have every sympathy with it but there's something more specific I wanted to say about Jeremy Vine and uh, in general and it relates to my mate Alex Belfield. You guys might not know the detail behind this, but perhaps you do. And I don't care whether you like, dislike, agree, disagree with Alex Belfield and what went on. Either way, Alex Belfield is a British guy serving two and a half years in prison and can't get out to a cat D for the crime of writing some emails, something called online stalking. Never once turned up at anyone's house, never once physically you know, stalking to me, you have to be licking someone's bathroom window or, you know, turning up to tr tell me that they're going to shoot me. That's happened to me plenty of times. Nothing's been done about that. But he was convicted of online stalking of Jeremy Vine and others. And in order to secure a crazy sentence for a new crime with no legal precedence, Jeremy Vine turned up and put on a terrific display in court, crying, showing a picture of Alex that he had to show to his daughters to warn them to be careful. I don't know if any of you have met Alex Belfield, 
But you know, he wears a sparkly jacket. He's about as terrifying as Velcro. He's about as, as likely to cause harm to someone's daughters, you know, as, as my dumb Labrador. Only one of them's dumb, the other one's very smart. Just to state that clearly. Any the which way, Jeremy Vine is now bringing uh, legal action against Joey Button. That will be phenomenally expensive for Joey any which way it goes. And he will be encouraged to just settle to get rid of it because that's what you're always encouraged to do, what I refused to do because I knew I knew it was wrong and I still know it's wrong even though it costs me everything. When I say everything, things that other people value. And what really bothers me about this is um, from a media perspective, Jeremy Vine worked with someone, I'm sure of it, this is my personal opinion, and he came out with a line that he wrote knowing it would be the headline, and he called my friend, Alex Belfield, the Jimmy Savile of stalking or trolling, I believe trolling, the Jimmy Savile of trolling, correct me if I'm wrong, I may be mistaken, but he, Jeremy Vine called Alex Belfield the Jimmy Savile of trolling. Now Jeremy Vine is launching legal action for defamation for for Joey Barton calling him a bike not nonce. Effectively, I guess, if you will, in other phrase, Jim, the Jimmy Savile of bike of cycling. <laughs> I mean, however you phrase that up. What I'm saying is the quieter thing that no one is seeing is that Jeremy used that exact phrase or words that are very similar in nature about Alex Belfield, but is suing or going for a defamation case against Joey Barton for using the same phraseology. And no one will go into that, even though I think that's actually the more interesting point. I mean, the actual significant point here is that libel law and defamation in this country is an absolute train wreck. And it's a train wreck because the establishment obviously needed to silence and eviscerate me. So the law, as you will appreciate, probably is not the law. It's whatever one man or whatever one very well-funded conglomerate of individuals, what it, what it actually was working against me, uh, wants to back, keep backing the court cases against me because they know they'll get a favourable outcome, which will be that I will be humiliated and removed and eviscerated. OK, and the final thing I wanted to just touch on, uh, more from a comedic perspective, although actually it's tragic, is that I was recently um, to Piers Morgan, despicable, uh, was on ITV News headlines, I had people going off on one, uh, people calling me, I don't know, you know, coming up, I wish she would just die. And that, that's fine because that's people's opinion, opinions. And when someone disagrees with you, typically they can be unkind or choose to be unkind because it's their way of channeling anger. But I said as a joke on my actual online pub, oh, I have to let you go early uh, this week because there's a new documentary out and it's Life After Derek. And I said that in reference to Kate Garraway, the Good Morning presenter on, I don't know, ITV, isn't it? And Derek just died. I think it was three days before. And I was making a comedic reference to the fact that my personal belief is that Kate Garraway milked Derek and long COVID and was very well funded by some interesting organisations, I'd suggest, to make these long, long COVID based documentaries in order to put the fear of God in people, in order to assist with the pushing of the vaccine. That's my personal opinion. So I made a gag, which actually I think was a clever bit of writing, if I do say so myself, about life after Derek. And the outrage was because I was being insensitive. I was being unkind. How could you? How despicable? How rude? But frankly, my personal opinion is that Kate Garraway did milk Derek did milk, long COVID did milk, whatever she's managed to make out of it from a book, 15 documentaries, an MBE, an OBE, a badge, awards, her face on everything, multiple interviews, magazine covers, whatever. I just find that a very odd way of dealing with someone who's going to pass away and now has. But it turns out there is a documentary. So ITV came out after I said my little joke and made a statement about there wouldn't be a documentary in Casey Hopkins is terrible. And there is. There is a documentary planned. It is coming. And it's going to be the last year of Derek's life. I mean, please. 
And that's the reason I found my writing to be particularly funny because it's so close to the truth that now it actually turns out it is and was true. So the gag goes that the new documentary will contain previously unseen footage. Oh no, wait a minute. There's no friggin' unseen footage because we've seen every frigging thing. But the new documentary will contain actual audio of Derek's actual last breaths because just by chance, the Sun newspaper was there to tactfully and respectfully record and photograph Derek's very, very last breaths. <sighs> you know what? As long as ITV have a checkbook, then dead Derek lives on. You know, Kate, whatever gets you through, bird, just don't expect me to not comment of it or have views. And if you think what I just said is horrendous, go for your life. Remind me where I asked you to agree with me. Remind me where I asked you to pay to support me. Remind me where I asked you to even watch or listen to any of this. Oh, that's right. I didn't. You chose to. <laughs> So that was my brief Thursday summary. I think the most important thing for me was just to make the point that I wanted to about Jeremy Vi, knowing what I know about Alex Belfield and truly having, you know, spent time with Alex in prison. Um, just what it actually means for a man to be locked up for two and a half years of his life. And how hard it is when you cannot rationalise something. I've always found it's much easier to deal with pain and punishment when you can rationalise it. It's much harder to deal with when you can't rationalise it because there is no rational explanation and then nothing much makes sense and the cruelty is all the more keen. And that's really how I feel about Alex Belfield. So there you are. I love you and leave you. And um, thank you again for all of your support, your kind comments and for sharing this. And uh, just as a little uh, PS is after yesterday, when I made comments about uh, more in-depth comments about reform and what's actually going on there from my uh, information and knowledge that I have. So many of you got in touch to say that they really got different bits of it, you know, and bits felt really how they how they see it as well. And then I had a lovely call in the middle of the afternoon from the wonderful Gerard Batten, who I haven't spoken to in absolute ages. I wouldn't have imagined for one moment he would have heard uh, what I had to say, but it was very lovely to speak to Gerard. And I think it's one of the things I really believe in, that when you speak truth and hold true to your path, uh, great things happen. So by speaking true about Gerard Batten, who was the greatest political leader we've never had the privilege of having. Um, I got to speak to Gerard and he's going to come and see me. I'm pointing to a poster that you can't see of my shows on the wall. He's going to come and join us in um, the Backyard Comedy Club in June for the second date that we've just added. Uh, so lovely Gerard will be there. And, and what a lovely thing that uh, uh, we'd all get to be back together and lovely Gerard will be there to help. Uh, jolly us along and laugh along with us that evening. So thanks to everybody for getting involved. Uh, do leave your comments, you know, um, agree, disagree, whatever you choose. Just always please bear in your heart that I never once ever asked you to agree. And that agreement and disagreement is different to being liked or being hated. And it's possible to disagree with someone without having to hate them or think them to be a monster. Okay, I'll see you on the road.